So, um, delight to be with you and uh, what I want to, to hope to do over the next hour or so, Keith, is that all right, 45 minutes for an hour, something like that, um, is just to give you a, a kind of a heads up really f for what's about to, to happen here in, in Aberdeen. Um, I don't know whether, have you seen in the press? I sent it up um, uh, to one of the Catholic uh, um, outlets. Did you see this? So this is a this is um, this is uh, a map, as you can see, <laughs> of the British Isles. Uh, this was a map composed by, uh, drawn drawn by Therese in, in, in a primary school. So what you're looking at is Therese's workbook, school book. Yeah, and. Uh, Okay, I mean, I'm not sure about the accuracy of it. <laughs> Interestingly, one of her um, favorite subjects um, at school was geography. In fact, if I remember rightly, her favorite subjects were science, geography, I think even maths, although I can't quite believe that myself because I hated maths at school, but, um, but geography, isn't that interesting? Someone who, was, who loved geography, and I'm sure that's how you know, these maps came to be dr uh, drawn, she's now exploring the places that she, she drew uh, in her childhood. And uh, if I zoom in there, um, hopefully, uh, you can see her version of Scotland, <laughs> and uh, so there we are, of course. Um, but look at the uh, look at the the places that she's um, specified. Can you see Glasgow, Paisley, Edinburgh, and Aberdeen? Ta da! <laughs> so I think I just think it's a wonderful thing that. You know, she's getting to visit these places that she, um, she drew on her maps at school. Um, and of course, this was part of her dream, um, wasn't it? She, she said, I would like to travel the earth. Remember this? I would like to travel the earth, preaching your name on all five continents and to the furthest isles. Well, this isn't very far from, <laughs> from uh, Lisieux, but uh, I guess it counts as an isle. And here she is. I mean, I think that's what's happening. Um, <clears throat> wherever she's going, wherever her relics are going, that's what she's doing. She's preaching. That's the important thing. You know, she's not on her holidays here. She's not sightseeing. She's preaching the Lord. She's bringing Jesus. Uh, to these places that she she drew on her maps uh, all those years ago, so she's ful fulfilling her dream. I think this is the the wonderful thing that uh, um, that we are conscious of in, in in this tour of her relics around around Scotland. Um, I don't know whether you know these relics have been, as it were. Uh, on pilgrimage, you could say, um, for many years. In fact, I think the particular casket that you're going to see, uh, which is a very beautiful, uh, beautiful one, that usually, if you've ever been to Lisieux, it usually stays under the main image of Therese in the side chapel of the Carmel. So if you've been, into, if you've been to Lisieux um, and you've been to the Carmel, there's a side chapel with an image of her, as it were, um, uh, in, in death. And underneath that, is where the relics that are coming to Aberdeen on Monday, that's where they usually stay. Um, and that reliquary, if I'm not mistaken, has been going around the world ever since she was declared a doctor of the church in 1997. See, that's again, I mean, I think of it, um, she said in one place in her uh, story of a soul, I want to be a saint, I want to be a doctor, I mean, in the sense of doctor of the church, in, in the sense that I want to enlighten souls, I want to teach. That's what a doctor of the church is, somebody who teaches. Um, I want to be a missionary. <laughs> I want to be a martyr. She has all these desires, you know, bubbling around. Um, and it's amazing how many of those desires have come true. She's become a saint. She's become a doctor. She's become the patron of the missions, you know? So please, so I, I just invite you to see that what, what's happening over the next few days is um, the fulfilling, the realization of, of Therese's uh, dream in that sense. 
um, but she's been all over. I was involved with the, um, the tour of her relics around the UK 10 years ago, so 2009. It was a time of great grace. Um, it was a time when I, I, to be honest, didn't know how, uh, you know, how, how it was going to go down, how, how that uh, visit was going to be received. And she, the, the first uh, place on the venue was in Portsmouth. And I booked into a hotel the night before, and I walked up to the cathedral not knowing what I would find. And there was a sea of press, not just the Catholic press, but the national press there, just eager to know what was this all about. So she cre seems to create interest wherever she goes. There's this drawing power, this magnetism that she has. And I hope that you're all going to ex experience uh, that, some of that and, 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 and the graces that she brings with her over the next few days. So, um, as I say, I was involved with that um, 10 years ago, but she's been all over. She's been to Russia, she's been to Iraq, she's been to this, t um, uh, last year she was in uh, Rwanda, she was in Burundi. Um, I was uh, uh, preaching with her relics in November in Denmark. So she did a tour around the Nordic countries. Um, and she even, I think she went to Iceland even. So she's been going to the furthest isles that she's been talking about. So it's just wonderful to be a part of that, I think. And I hope that, um, you know, that, um, that, that this will be an experience of grace for you. And uh, I perhaps would, the first thing I'd say to you is, start already thinking what graces you'd like from her. You know, and, and she's someone who teaches us um, to have great expectations in our prayer. So don't think, well, I won't ask that because that's too much. Nothing's too much for Therese. In fact, she'd be honored if you, you know, wanted a grace that, like, seemed a bit of a tall order. She loves that. So get her on the case, whatever case that is, either for yourself or some, for somebody else. Um, I was hearing confessions just now, just come from Dundee, where her relics have been for the last uh, three days, four days, and now from tea time today, uh, the relics are going to Edinburgh, and I think they're coming here, aren't they, from, from Edinburgh on Monday afternoon. And one of the things I've be, I was um, hearing confessions, and one of the things I was saying to people um, as a penance, I was saying, now, for your penance, go to the reliquary and put both your hands on the perspex of that reliquary, and let one hand represent you and the grace you'd like to receive from, from her, um, and let the other hand you choose. Let that hand be a grace you want for somebody else, maybe somebody who can't get to the reliquary for whatever reason, or somebody who wouldn't even see the point of coming, who, you know, for, for whom this wouldn't mean anything at all. You know? Um, so no grace is too challenging. In fact, I would say the more challenging the grace, um, the more honored Therese would be by that. Um, so don't hold back. Have great expectations and be thinking already of the specific graces you'd like to receive from her visit um, to Aberdeen. So just as a kind of a way into what I wanted to talk about uh, this afternoon, basically what I want to do this afternoon is to just give you four, if I remember, um, little things that, that uh, or, or um, aspects of her, what she called her little way. So if you like, it's her, that's the way she described her particular experience of discipleship. Her little way, sometimes she calls it the little way of of trust and loving surrender. Little way, but basically what she's talking about is um, a way to follow, a, a, a road map, if you like. Um, and uh, so I want to just to, to, to um, zoom in on some key areas of that little way that I hope that are gonna help, you know, uh, prepare you to understand what, what she stands for what she represents, but particularly that will um, help to encourage you on your next steps in, in your road to discipleship. But just before I get onto those four little things, just a few um, uh, preliminaries, or at least one preliminary, I could say, um, and it's just to look, to look at that word little. I was just uh, had some, um, just had lunch with the community here at St Andrews, and I was very really taken by their devotion to the child Jesus, and I still haven't quite um, got into that and where that came from and, and what that's about. But of course, it's exactly 
a devotion that, that uh, uh, Therese was drawn to, and that's why she chose her name, Therese of the Child Jesus. In fact, her full title, you could say, is, is St. Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. She added that last bit um, a little bit later. And, okay, we'll leave that to, to one side for now, but, but what was it about the Child Jesus that attracted her? So maybe just a bit, a bit about that um, in terms of this, this word, which was a real watchword for her, which is the word little, okay? Now just as a, 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 a way into this, this is her mother, Zeli, and her trade, her, um, uh, what she did for a living was, in fact, round her neck there. Look, she was a, a lace maker. She, she, she had a little studio making um, uh, Pointe d'Alencon. So they lived at that stage in Alencon in, uh, in Normandy. And uh, that was a, a kind of a center for lace making. And uh, uh, Therese's mother had a little studio where they made this very fine, you can see, very delicate um, uh, lace. Very famous, um, very sought after, very expensive. And uh, I just think, there's something about that that, as it were, came to Therese with her mother's milk. You know, what do you need for, to make lace like that? You need a keen eye for detail, little things, sig the significance of, 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 of each stitch. You know, it's so important. I can't believe that some of that didn't come down into Therese um, as, she, as she grew up. And the same with the father. This is Louis. By the way, the both uh, Therese's mum and dad have been canonized as well. Um, and uh, in fact, when I was with the relics in, in Denmark, both relics, the reliquary that's coming here and the one of her mum and dad were going round together. And there was a real sense in which there was a kind of an illustration of how saints beget saints. You know, um, Therese be became a saint because, in large part, because of her mother and father, because they were so holy. Um, Louis's uh, trade was a what? He was a watchmaker. Again, what you need to be a good watchmaker, a good clockmaker, you need an eye for detail. To, uh, you know, to see the, the little delicate mechanisms uh, that, that just make such a difference in that, in, that, in that world, as it were. So just to start by saying, I, I don't think it's accidental that um, this, the, you know, the, the trades of mum and dad of, of Therese kind of have influenced um, some of the, uh, Therese's approach to, 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 um, uh, to discipleship in terms of the importance, the significance of, you might say, the, you know, we say the devil is in the detail. Well, she could see through her mother and father how the divine is in the detail too. That the little things matter. Little things are hugely significant. Does anybody know where this is? Anybody been here? It's in the Holy Land, Bethlehem. Exactly. This is the this is the 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 the, the, uh, the main door of the church into the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. If you ever get there, now look at that. You know, I think it's so wonderful that in order to get into the Church of the Nativity, you have to make yourself small. You know? um, this is a a former parish priest of mine who's having to bend to get into that church. The only people who have no problem getting into that church are children. Isn't that so right? <laughs> you know? and, and of course, this is what te uh, Therese teaches us. You know, that littleness is such a key attitude. Um, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, entering the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's only the little ones who can really get in there without any problem. And Therese is one of those little ones, and she's teaching us how to be little. You know? Um, so there's something there that we really, really need to, to, to learn from, from, from her. 
and as I'll be saying actually over the uh, course of the masses over the weekend, um, the last few Sundays have been kind of leading us up in, 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 to her teaching in this area. What did we have? A um, couple of Sundays ago, try your best to enter through the narrow door. <laughs> as if, you know, we need to kind of be squeezed, uh, narrowed down, you know, uh, in order to kind of slim down, in order to get through. That's what Therese is offering us. How do we do that? How do we become small? Last Sunday, make your way to the lowest place. Ah, Therese, in one place she says, I run to the lowest place. Knowing that's the place where, you know, if you can get to the lowest, lowest place, if you've got an ambition for the lowest place, that, that, that's, that's the place to go for because that's where God is going to say, move up higher. <laughs> and he's not just to say that, he's gonna do it. He's going to, you know, um, one of the great images in Therese's uh, story of a soul is a, that of a lift. You know, she was saying, we live in an age of inventions uh, where in the houses of the rich now you don't need uh, stairs. You know, you don't need to climb the stairs. You've got a lift to take you there. And she says, that's what I've discovered is, is about, about growing in holiness. I'm too small to, to, to climb the rough stairway of, of, of perfection. But the Lord has revealed to me, I don't need to climb that stairs. He's provided me with the lift, the arms of Jesus. So as you see, begin to see how she turns this um, conventional understanding of holiness on its head um, and uh, invites us to do something that's kind of counterintuitive in our culture, uh, which is to, uh, to, 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 to become small, to minimize ourselves, to, to make our strategy that of um, going lower, going down in order to, 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 to go up, as it were. So, with that as an introduction, and sorry, that was a long introduction, wasn't it? Let me take you to a particular constellation that you may be f familiar with um, in the night sky, the constellation Orion. Okay, in her, um, in her um, autobiography, and I won't be able to find it now because I should have, uh, I should have uh, earmarked the place before, beforehand, but um, she talks about being out walking with her, with her father one time, and she looks up in the sky and she sees this, uh, this constellation, and she's struck by this formation here. Okay, so this is Orion's belt, yeah? And this is, can you kind of see, it's not a star, it's a kind of smudge, it's a, it's a nebula, it's a galaxy. And, um, but what Therese saw when she looked up was, and she said, Dad, my name is written in heaven. So from here on in, whenever you see that this constellation, I want you to see a T. And I want to, you to see what, you know, when you're looking at that, you're, you're, you're looking at what Ther Therese as a little child saw, and she said, my name is written in heaven. Okay, and, but what I want to do now is to, to give you four aspects, dimensions of her little way, all beginning with T. So you're gonna be thinking now, what's the next one? Okay, so, but that's just by way of trying to remember some of these, some of these things, okay? So the first one, and I think the most important one when it comes to Therese, is trust. If there's one word that captures the spirituality of St. Therese of the Child Jesus, it's trust. Um, in, if, if any of you speak French, in French the word is confiance, and you can hear the word confidence, and you could translate it as confidence, but I think in English trust gets it better, first of all, because it's just one syllable, but also because there's a sense in which there's a, there's, a, there's a personal quality to that word that's really, really important in terms of our trust in God. Can you see how that feels? It feels much more personal, much more intimate than to say our confidence in God, which is a little bit more theoretical somehow. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not wrong, but it's just, I think trust gets to it much better. Um, so it features a lot in her teaching. So here's just a few, a few little, um, you know, of her famous things with trust in it. My favorite one, I think, is if I had a t-shirt that I, you know, put a thing on of Therese, it would be this one. Trust triggers miracles. I really think that it's just, I mean, you know, like so many other things Teresa says, it sounds so simple, but in fact, it's really profound. You know, this weekend, we're coming to celebrate, as we always do on a Sunday, the biggest miracle, the miracle of miracles, the resurrection of the Lord. What triggered that miracle? Trust. The trust of Jesus. You know, when I, whenever I look at a, a cross, I see the letter T. And, 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 and the first letter in, in, the word, in the word trust. And what, what's the cross about? It's about Christ's trust. The, the trust he took to the cross, the, the trust that held him on the cross, and that trust was what triggered the, mir the miracle of miracles, tri triggered the resurrection, triggered Easter. So this is, you know, this is profound stuff. This is life-changing stuff. Um, my way is all trust and love. She had that love, she loved this image of a, she saw herself as a little bird, but a very little bird, a bird that couldn't even fly yet. But all the bird could do was just to show it wanted to fly and by putting up its wings and flapping. But of course, she, you know, she knew she, she, you know, she wasn't going to be able to take off. But again, that didn't matter. It didn't matter because Jesus, she says, as the divine evil eagle would come down. Again, it's another way of talking about the lift, the elevator. He would come down and take her up on his own wings. But what were those wings? Trust and love. These are the two wings, as it were, that, that uh, raise us up to, 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 to God. By the way, when, you, when, when Therese talks about trust, I think she basically means, um, you know how uh, Paul talks about faith, hope, and, and love as being the most important things? I think for Therese, trust is the first two joined, faith and hope. That's what trust is. So I go to God, I go to him. Sorry, here's a... This is the last line of her autobiography, of her story of her soul. The very last, I mean, she didn't mean it to be. Um, she didn't know she was not going to be able to finish that story. But by God's providence, the last words she wrote were, were these. I go to him by trust and love. Literally, actually, in the French, it's I lift myself to him by trust and love. So there's a sense in which those that trust and love are the wings by which we, we raise ourselves or are raised to God. Here's another great quote uh, that includes both trust and love. Trust and nothing but trust must lead us to love. So I can't emphasize enough that, um, you know, well, I, wouldn't it be great if as a result of this visit, you could sense the temperature, as it were, of your trust rising by a few degrees. Well, that would be a wonderful grace. I'm sure that would be a grace she'd want to give um, you. So that's the first T. Any questions on that before we go on to the next one? Was there anything, anything not clear, anything that needed clarification there? Can we go on to the second one? So, the second one is truth. Therese was passionate about the truth. I remember taking this um, uh, image into a primary school once um, on Therese's feast day and the head teacher says, just talk, talk, tell them about Therese. And this was, so this was like five-year-olds right through to 11-year-olds. And I was thinking, well, what am I, I going to do? So I decided to take in this photograph and I said to them, this is a photograph of a saint. Of course, they didn't know who it was at this stage. Tell me something about her just by looking at her photograph. 
obviously I know that this was a bit of a risk, <laughs> but the forest of hands went up and the first three hands that I chose, the first one said, she looks as though she couldn't tell a lie. Isn't that beautiful? Second one, she looks stubborn. <laughs> Third one, she looks cheeky. <laughs> And they were spot on, all three were absolutely spot on. And, and I could tell the story of Therese really with those three characteristics. But wasn't it interesting, the first one, she looks as though she could never tell a lie. And it's absolutely true, from her earliest days, um, uh, she, she had this um, transparency. There was a, there's a little story she tells about when she was a little kid, and for some reason, some mischievous reason, she started to pull the wallpaper off the, off the, you know, off the wall. So pick it off the, um, off the wall. And, but instead of waiting for mum to say, who's been picking the wallpaper off? She went straight up to her mum and she said, do you know who's been, <laughs> who's been picking the wallpaper? It was me. You know, she just couldn't hide the truth. And she teaches us uh, to do the same. Here's one of her lovely prayers about truth. Make me see things as you, as they really are. Just give you the full quote. Oh my God, I want to listen to you well. I beg you to answer me when I ask you humbly, what is truth? Make me see things as they really are. Let nothing throw dust into my eyes. What a beautiful prayer. Make me see things as they really are. And she knew when she was saying that, that might be painful. Because as she saw things as they really are, there may be things that would be challenging or things that might be disappointing because she thought things were like this, but they're in fact not like that, they're like this. So she was ready for it to be a kind of a revelation that wasn't kind of like um, totally in her favor. But what a wonderful thing. Make me see things as they really are. And I think Therese helps us to see things as they really are. Certainly when it comes to uh, how she treated her novices, because um, another uh, thing about Therese was that she actually never left the novitiate. When she finished her own novitiate, she was then appointed by the mother superior, by the prioress, to, to, as the role of, of, of novice mistress, even though she, she, she didn't have that title technically, um, but that's what she did. And in fact, that's the reason why we have the little way as we have it, because I don't think otherwise we, she would have formulated it quite so definitely. But because she had to teach others, and those of you who are teachers will know this, um, you know, uh, she had to get hold of something much more firmly than otherwise she would have needed to. You know, you, when you teach something, you, you need to get hold of it first yourself in a, in a new way. So but I think, again, it was providential that she was appointed as no, novice mistress. Um, but one of the things was, um, she would say to them, uh, don't come near me if you don't want to know the truth. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. You know, I'm not going to, you know, pussyfoot around here. I'm not going to soft pedal that truth. Um, because, and of course you knew that, that it's only the truth that sets us free in the end. So actually when we're speaking truth, we're doing that, that person a favor. Um, so tr Therese, as a, as, a, as a truth lover and a truth speaker, here's another couple of quotes, I can nourish myself on nothing but the truth. I have a horror of pretense. And of course that truth is um, about living in, well, the li it's living in the real world, isn't it? It's not about living in the world we'd like it to be, um, or it's not about being the person we'd like to be. It's being the person we are. And that's, embracing that is, is humility. And of course, humility is, a, is, an, is another um, huge um, uh, dimension aspect of the, of the little way. 
And humility not as being humble in the sense of false. We're not talking about false humility. She would have hated false humility. You know, like Uriah Heep in whatever Dickens novel that was. Oliver, was it? Uh, Oliver Twist. You know, oh, I'm ever so humble. You know, <laughs> that's not humility. <laughs> you know, humility is, is being real. Have you ever wondered why is humility, when it's true humility, why is it so attractive? We find really humble people irresistibly attractive. So why do we spend so much energy on, on pride, on being proud? Have you, ever, have you ever admired someone who's proud? No, you haven't. Pride is ugly always. You know, you'll be thinking, who, this, who does he think he is? You know? So why, we, why do we spend so much energy being proud when everybody else around us is thinking, who do you think you are? <laughs> you know, it's not attractive. And it's not attractive because it's not true. <coughs> Whatever gifts one has, that's not down to you. It's down to the fact that God has given you them. You don't take the credit. He does. That's what living in the truth is all about, and that's what being humble is all about, and that's why she says, as long as you're humble, you'll be happy. Why? Because you're living in the truth. You're seeing things as they really are. You're seeing God as he really is. You're seeing yourself as you really are, which is always much better than you th think, by the way. Um, you're seeing the world as it really is. You're seeing each other as they really are. I was talking to um, the... Uh, young ladies at lunch about the fact that I've just been doing an a inv investigation for my uh, bishop on G.K. Chesterton. By the way, Scottish connection, Gilbert Keith oh, yes. Chesterton, that betrays his Scottish ancestry. I'm not sure quite where. But as I think of it now, there was a, somebody he was really admired who was from Aberdeen. What was his name? He wrote novels. Does anybody know who I mean? Um, and Chesterton called him the St. Francis of Aberdeen. What was his name? Was George MacDonald. George MacDonald. Does that ring any bells at all? No. <laughs> George MacDonald was a, 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 like a bit of a C.S. Lewis type writer for, for, young, for young kids. But those, those, those books were really grown up, if you know what I mean, in that sense. That, um, so uh, George MacDonald, I think he was a minister, wasn't he? And, uh, Church of Scotland or Presbyterian or something like that. Anyhow, um, Chesterton had a huge admiration for, for this, this man who he obviously thought was a, a very holy man. Digression. <laughs> uh, reason that Chesterton's up here, he loved humility. And um, again, for a man of such gigantic intellect who could so easily have, um, you know, looked down on others and, and, and um, sort of uh, um, belittled them, you know, he didn't. Everybody who met him was amazed at how humble he was. And he says here many of the quotable things that uh, um, he wrote is, uh, the secret of life lies in laughter and humility. Um, he wrote a, a book about, I'm just going to quote a, um, a, a bit of this poem. The, the poem is called The Ballad of the White Horse. Um, it's about King Alfred, who burnt the cakes. Um, well, that's not so important, but here's my favorite uh, lines from the poem that Alfred is, is, is talking about, the difference between pride and humility. Here we are. This is, King Alfred says, Pride flings frail palaces at the sky as a man flings up sand, but the firm feet of humility take hold of heavy land. Pride juggle, juggles with her toppling towers, they strike the sun and cease. The firm feet of humility, they grip the ground like trees. You know the word humility comes from the word humus, ground. So the humble person is the grounded person, the person who's living in the real world, who's rooted like those trees, you know? Chesterton was such a man, Therese was such a person. Um, she wants to be um, blessing us with that gift. This is the um, statue that Chesterton gave to the church 
he, um, he went to in Beaconsfield, where I was parish priest for seven years. This is the statue of Mary he found, and the reason I've put it up here is because Mary's feet if you can see, are barefoot. She's the one, she's the most wonderful one who know, who's, who's humble. She's, you could say, the humblest person there's ever been. And, and the most blessed, the most beautiful. And she knew that all of that, all the, where did the credit lie for all of that? My soul magnifies the Lord, you know? She's the one who t teaches Therese and Chesterton. Chesterton had a wonderful de uh, devotion to, uh, to Our Lady as well as uh, Therese. Um, she's the one who teaches us the, the real world is the world where all is grace, as, as Therese would say. And so we've got to be grounded in it, no matter how painful that, that is sometimes. Another little thing here about truth, uh, um, so humility is an aspect of truth, also simplicity is an as aspect of truth. Prayer is a simple look, Therese once said, and by that she meant a, a, a simple, not in the sense of easy, simple in the sense of straightforward. You know, when you look at someone in the eye, that's a simple look. You know, you're not doing a Princess Diana, you know, through the eyelashes or, you know, it's straight on, face to face. Um, is, that's what, that's the kind of prayer that uh, um, uh, Therese teaches us. I love only simplicity. For simple souls, there must be no complicated w ways. I don't know where you can see here that actually the words simplicity and complicated come from the same word. I love, I'm a bit of a word nerd. Um, and uh, so the word here, simplicity, literally means, uh, the first bit of it comes from the word once, and the main bit, plicare, means to fold. So literally, to be simple is to be folded once. Now, that might not mean so much until we realize that what's the opposite of simplicity is complicated, meaning folded many times, or duplicity, folded twice. So you see, again, it's about truth. But basically, what's going on there is if you're simple, you're not hiding from the truth. If you're being duplicitous, you're hiding, you're in the, those folds. If something is too complicated, you're getting lost in the, all the folds. What needs to happen is for you to be opened out. And again, this is what, um, this is what uh, Therese uh, does for us, you know. Uh, I hope over the next few days you'll feel her unfolding you, bringing you out of hiding, making you more trans transparent, more honest, more upfront. Um, and use that uh, image of the, of the corporal at Mass, because that's sometimes when I'm opening up the corporal, I think of that, you know, the, 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 that the um, corporal is only ready to receive the gifts that will be transformed into our Lord when it's unfolded. Therese unfolds us in her simplicity. One last little um, illustration about this truth, and by the way, this is the longest section in the, you know, the next two um, T's are much quicker. Um, but just to talk about uh, one particular relationship um, um, that she had, and we actually was with a fellow novice. This lady here is called Sister Martha. And they actually entered the same year as postulants. And at the beginning, they got on really well and they were quite close friends. Um, but something happened in, um, uh, well, basically something happened in, in, in Martha. Well, Therese noticed that Martha was getting far too attached to the mother prioress. You know, she, like people do sometimes, they get too clingy, um, too needy. I think the Americans would you say over needy. <laughs> you know, uh, she was a bit over needy, and so she always wanted, was always running to the mother superior, asking questions, wanting her time, wanting her attention, and so on. And Therese could see that was happening, and she couldn't not say something. Because she basically, was, she, she, she recognized that Martha was not doing herself a favor by being so, so clingy. 
And I wonder if I can quickly find in her, um, in her story how she, how, how she came to um, resolve that. Do excuse me as I look up Martha, 236. So basically, Therese decides, I've got to tell her, no matter how hard that is. And this is what happened. Actually, let me just read you just a few lines before what happened. She says, uh, at this time, God made me understand that there are souls for whom his mercy never tires of waiting and to whom he grants his light only by degrees. So I was careful not to advance his hour and waited patiently till it pleased Jesus to have this hour come. What she means is she didn't, she bided her time. She looked for the right moment. So when Whenever you, you know, needing to speak truth to somebody, you need to ask God, when's the right time to do that? Don't just go rushing in and blurting it out, you know, because that that's usually more to do with, uh, you, you know, your own issues then. You, you just can't stop yourself, as it were. But Therese knew, no, I need to, you know, this is a, a moment, a delicate moment. I need to find the right time to tell her. But anyway. Eventually, the hour we decided on for coming together arrived. The poor little sister casting a look at me saw immediately that I was no longer the same. She sat down beside me bl blushing and I placed, listen to this, I placed my head, her head upon her, my heart and told her with tears in my voice. Isn't that beautiful? I told her with tears in my voice everything I was thinking about her. And she underlines that phrase, everything I was thinking about her. But I did this with such tender expressions and showed her such great affection that very soon her tears were mingled with mine. She acknowledged with great humility that what I was saying was true and she promised to commence a new life asking me as a favor always to let her know her faults. Isn't that beautiful? I hope we have truth speakers in our lives like that. You know, people who, who love us enough to tell us what, what's really going on or what as they, you know. Um, and I hope we too can be truth, truth speakers to others. We can speak truth in that way, yes, Therese, knowing you know, the, the right time to do it and how to do it and to do it with tears in my voice. In other words, you know, not to take relish in this, but we're doing it for that person. So we're doing it for love. We're speaking, as um, St. Paul says, we're speaking the truth with, with love. So, there may be some truths that Therese wants to teach you and speak to you uh, during her visit here. Be open to that. Or she may be wanting to help you to um, become more of a, a, a truth speaker to others. Um, look out for that. The closer one gets to God, the simpler one becomes. So just closing this bit of a section before we do the other two T's really, really quickly, because I realize I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, the, the thing about all these things is, the more humble we can't become, the more truthful we become, the more simple we become, the more like God we become, because He is truth. So whenever we are growing in these virtues, we're growing in the likeness of the Lord. Now, for some reason, I've got um, Father Brown up here. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I know what he was. Um, one of the great highlights of the uh, invest investigation I did um, was to meet someone who had knew the original Father Brown. So um, the original Father Brown was a chap called Monsignor John O'Connor, who was a, uh, a priest at, down in Leeds, and he and uh, Chesterton became great friends. And so Chesterton models his Father Brown books on that figure. Now, I met somebody who was the altar server of Monsignor John O'Connor. He's now in his 90s, bless him, and a lovely, lovely holy man too. But he said he remembers as a little boy F Father O'Connor coming into the sacristy and saying, young man, remember, seeking truth is squaring your mind with reality not the other way around. Isn't that beautiful? And, I've, and, and this um, 
this uh, little boy obviously didn't know what on earth that meant when he, when he first heard it, but he said that stayed with him all his life and the older he's got, the more that has meant to him. And boy, do we need to hear it more and more these days. Because of course we live in a world that wants to square reality with me, you know. I am my own truth and I'm gonna f make everything fit into that. No! As Margaret Thatcher would say, no, no, no. <laughs> um, it's, you know, when we, when, we, when we meet, when we encounter truth, it brings us out of ourselves. And we have to adapt ourselves to that truth. We have to adjust, adjust our lives. That's what repentance is. That's what conversion is. Rearranging myself around the truth, which is beyond me. Okay, last two T's. Um, penultimate one is thanks. Thanksgiving is such an important theme in Therese's um, writing. Here's my favorite quote uh, with regard to gratitude. The spirit of gratitude draws down upon us the overflow of God's grace. No sooner have we thanked him for one blessing than he speedily sends us ten additional blessings. When we thank him for these, he multiplies blessings to such a degree that we seem to be under a constant stream of divine graces all coming our way. And as if to sense that we don't, some of us might not quite really believe that, she says, if I have experienced it, you try it and you'll see. So if you doubt that, try it. Up the gratitude in your life and you'll experience transformation. There is no doubt about that. At the minute, my, the three pr prayers I hear, overhear myself saying more and more are, thank you, sorry, please. <laughs> and they go straight to the heart of things. But particularly, I think, th thank you. Thank you opens doors. Why? Because it's one of the best ways we can display to God our trust. Trust is one of the best expressions, or rather thank you, is one of the best expressions of, of, of saying, because we're saying, when we say thank you, we're saying I trust you. Thank you is a very vulnerable place to be. Because we're basically saying I trust you to give me what I need. And so that's why the tr trust is, is, is fundamental here. Here's another favorite quote from um, uh, Chesterton. You say grace before meals, all right. But I say grace before the concert and grace before the play, grace before I open a book and grace before painting, swimming, playing, walking, and grace before I pick up my pen. In other words, grace before everything, because everything is grace. The more grateful we are, the more graceful our lives will be. I say to my students sometimes, grace before internet. <laughs> you know? and, it's, and it's really important because then you, you put yourself in the right place for whatever it is to be a gift, but not something you snatch at and grab for yourself. That's when, when, when we find ourselves grabbing at something, that's when things go wrong. When we start manipulating and controlling and, and um, you know, wanting things for ourselves in that way. The aim of life is appreciation, says Chesterton in his um, autobiography. Now you might think, well, that's a bit of an overstatement, but I think, well, maybe it is, but he's got a, he's, he's, he's got a point. I, certainly in terms of, um, you know, I promise you, if you become more appreciative than you are right now, life will be sweeter. In other words, basically, don't we take things for granted? And when we take things for granted, we miss out. 
have you noticed how food tastes sweeter when you say grace before meals? <laughs> it's true! When we don't take it for granted, when we don't snatch at it, when we don't think it's my right, you know? Here's another lovely th phrase here. By the way, St. Francis was G.K.'s favorite saint. And so this is the memorial window to Ch Chesterton in the church where, um, where he was uh, buried from. But he's talking about Francis here. He was above all a great giver and he cared chiefly for the best kind of giving, which is called thanksgiving. And if another great man wrote a grammar of ascent, that's uh, Cardinal Human, Newman, uh, soon to be canonized, he, Francis, may well be said to have written a grammar of acceptance, a grammar of gratitude. I want to say that's true of Chesterton too, and it's true of Therese. She teaches us to be grateful. I would even say that maybe that's the most important thing she teaches us. Because that thank you, as I say, is what opens the doors to God's providence in our lives like, like nothing else. Just, a, uh, just before we go on to um, the final T, anybody know who this is? You can guess he's a passionist. Ignatius Spencer, have you ever heard of him up, uh, up here? He actually died up in Scotland. He died in the uh, um, car Carstairs, uh, just outside the station there, uh, when he was doing a mission. In fact, his last mission he ever did was in um, Motherwell, in, uh, I think it was Carflin. Is he related to Princess Diana? <laughs> That's the one. They don't look the same, though, do they? <laughs> She's also, he's also related to Winston Churchill, and they de definitely look a bit li alike, don't they? Um, but here's the, here's the thing that I uh, recently heard um, Ignatius Spencer say about, about all of this. He says, if you've got an obstacle in your life, think of it as a piece, as like a stone or a rock. And then he says, think of uh, gratitude as a... As a a uh, chisel or a, whatever you call one of those things. So basically, every time you say thank you, it's like the hammer on the chisel on the rock. Now he says, you, you put, you, you know, for the first few times, it's, you're thinking, well, this is not doing any good whatsoever. But he says, maybe after 200 times, that rock will split. And it's all because of gratitude. In other words, we make our way forward through all sorts of obstacles because of gratitude. This is where Ignatius put it. Let us thank God in anticipation. So if there's something you want, if there's something you want from Therese during these coming days, thank God for it already. Don't, you know, don't think, oh, that's too much to ask and therefore I'm, you know, it's probably never going to happen. You know, I say to people, thank God for the job he's got in store for you, even though you know what it is yet. Thank God for the um, person that you want to marry, even though you've not met them yet. Thank God up front, and y y you'll be moving in their direction straight away. You'll be putting yourself in the best place possible for that providence to be, to be given. For me, prayer, she says, is a cry of gratitude. So let's um, all seek to that, that grace from, from Therese in these, in these days, an increase of, of gratitude in our lives. Final T, today. I was telling the people in Carthin um, a story of um, a little girl. She was about, about five or six, I think, and uh, I was walking along this uh, disused r railway track um, and uh, she was coming in the opposite direction with her mum and dad just a few paces behind. And so I was thinking, oh, I better get off the path. She was, you know, skipping in front of her parents. I thought, I'll get off the path, let her skip past so she's not intimidated by me. So I got off the path and uh, the little girl skips right up to me. <laughs> and eyeballs me and I'm kind of thinking, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And she says, full of confidence, she says, you don't know who I am, do you? <laughs> and I said, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't. And then she looked at me as if I was stupid. And she said, as if it wasn't obvious, she says, I'm a princess. <laughs> And she put me immediately in, in mind of, of, of Therese. 
you know, um, and, and of what charms Jesus about children. And not just Jesus, but ourselves. You know, that, well, the first thing is today, that child was not fretting, you know, about the future. She wasn't paralyzed by what had happened in the past. She was living in, the, in, that, in that moment where she was a princess, <laughs> you know? And uh, so, but that's, isn't that lovely about, about children? When we're in the presence of children, they bring us into the present. Because they're so, it's, they're so immediate, they're living, and you might say, now is the only world they know. And so Therese, she brings us into the present. You know, when you, if you're talking to kids, how they bring out the child in you, don't they? You know, you, go, you see them meet a baby and, and you go, oh, boop, 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 boop. you know? <laughs> you become a little baby in, in, in front of them, you know? And that's what happens with Therese. She brings us out of ourselves and into the present and brings out the child in us. And let her do that to, uh, during these days. Um, that that uh, little girl, was exhibiting trust. I'm sure when she got back to her parents, they would have um, scolded her for, or told her off for, for talking to strangers. But that's so hard for um, for kids, isn't it? I mean, uh, I mean that's why they have to be told not to talk to, to strangers because their instinct is to talk to anybody. Trust is a child's in intuition, and trust is that gift that Therese teaches us, or re-teaches us, as it were. We relearn that trust um, in, her, in her presence. And then I'm a princess, you know. That little child knew she was significant. She knew she was important. She had no trouble believing she was a princess. Therese likewise, and of course she got a head start on the rest of us because she had two doting parents who loved her to bits. So that don't we know? Sometimes we we don't have that. So, um, but but you know, I mean, her dad actually called her my little queen. <laughs> so she thought she was royalty, but of course she was, and we all are. For heaven's sake, that's what the gospel is all about. We are God's beloved sons and daughters. We are precious. We've got royal blood running through our veins. I think I'm going to stop there because I'm going over time and uh, it's ten past three. So, um, any, any, have we got some questions or? Yeah, I've got lots of time. Have we got lots of time? Have got some? You want more time or you're back? Just what can you tell us about today? Today. Today. Okay. Um, well, okay. She wrote one of her poems um, was My Song of Today. Um, there's a lovely thing she says Jesus doesn't want us to lay up provisions. He nourishes me at each moment with a food that is totally new. Isn't that beautiful? So Jesus doesn't want me to lay up provision. What she's saying is to live in today, in the present moment, we have to trust. We have to trust in God's providence. I know these, uh, this community here, that's a really important thing for them, sorry, um, you know, but it, it, it is a thing that's really important for us all and perhaps hopefully in our lives in different ways we've had a glimpse of when we've had to trust in God's providence, it's really been a beautiful time in our lives because we've actually experienced, oh my word, this works, you know. Now I come from, my, my dad <clears throat> was a hardened hoarder. Um, every Saturday he used to go off to the auction sales and buy a load of rubbish which he then uh, put in the garage down at the bottom of the uh, garden just in case it, it might come in handy. <laughs> well, of course, it's, I mean, those places, I mean, dear old dad, he's 99 now and he's in uh, um, residential care. 
Um, but those, those garages are full of this stuff, you know? And I'm the same. I'm a bit of a chip, chip off the only, uh, old block, but with regard to books, that's my thing, I award. I just have that, that might come in handy. There may be something good in there. Da, da, da. You know, and we all do this in different ways, don't we? And it's because we're a bit frightened that we might not have what we need right now. And what Therese is saying is, let go of that fear. So one of the things, again, the thing I'm, I'm going to talk about this weekend is this, you know, at the heart of, of her discipleship, the discipleship, the, well, it's not her discipleship, it's the discipleship of the Lord, is this letting go. And that's the thing, I think one of the hardest things we do is, is, to, is, is, is to let go, to say no. Um, but I think those, that letting go and that saying no are what make us present and open to receive whatever the Lord wants to give us in the, in the, in the present moment. Does that make any sense, uh, yes. Keith? And again, that's why it comes back to trust. You know, trust is what brings us into the present moment and why it's so, it's so beautiful. I think we should leave it there, should we? And uh, just to say, I mean, I don't, um, this is not, I'm not trying to be a, a kind of salesman here at all, but I just happened to bring 10 books of mine. There are two here, There's the, the two, I've written two books on Therese. Uh, one that was for the relics, um, uh, the, 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 the relics tore down in, 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 in uh, the UK 10 years ago. Um, and one that was basically some studies that I did many years ago and that I wrote up. So, they're here. Anybody wants them? Great fiver. <laughs> Um, but uh, but don't I mean I goodness you know if they, they if they're there at the, by the end don't think I'm going to be uh, at all offended and um, but uh, just if you were thinking what which one should I get I would say if you know something already about Therese and you think I'd like to go deeper this is the one basically this is an exploration you know the phrase in the mass. Uh, just before the Our Father, uh, in, um, at the Saviour's command and, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say that expression there, this book is about that. We dare to, what does it mean to dare to say? Um, and it, uh, what I'm doing is, is drilling down into that word, where it comes from, where it, what it means, and then showing uh, Teresa's illustrating that word. So that's a, this is a little bit more difficult in that sense, a little bit more technical if you like. This one is m much more something you can just pick up, open it at page, read a little bit and put it down again. It's also got pictures <laughs> and quotes and things like that. So it's just a bit more uh, something you could pray with maybe. You know, so like a, a book you could pick up, just read a few sentences and then um, that would help you sort of uh, launch yourself into a time of prayer. But uh, anyway, thanks very much. <coughs> so thanks to Father John for that. I could have kept on listening for another hour or so. I was really enjoying that. So I didn't want to end it. That's just me. So thank you very much for coming all the way up here. Oh, yeah. So we're